It's such a treat to be welcoming Lane Mosler to the store tonight for her debut book, Driving Hungry. Lane has written for New York Magazine, The Guardian, and NPR. Her journey in this book began in Buenos Aires, where she had moved, determined to write about food. The journey started simply. After a disastrous dance class, she fled the class and asked the taxi driver to take her to his favorite restaurant. And from there, a mission, a way of life, and a successful blog was born. In Driving Hungry, Lane follows the culinary advice of taxi drivers through Buenos Aires, back to New York City, and all the way to Berlin. Along the road, she found a taxi, a love, and a voice of her own. Please help me welcome Lane Mosler to Politics and Prose. Thank you, Liz. Can you hear me? Um, thank you all for coming tonight. I'm going to read a couple of excerpts um, from, from the book. And I, I want to tell you about this first one um, and how this whole crazy taxi project was born. Um, I had been in, living in Buenos Aires for two years. And I was taking a lot of taxi cabs and dancing tango and dancing tango late at night when the buses weren't running and the, bu the subway stopped running and the buses were pretty irregular. And I was having these conversations with cab drivers and learning more about the city from them than I was learning from anyone else. And somewhere along the way, I decided, well, if they know so much about the city, surely they must know where to find good things to eat. But I wasn't really brave enough to test out that hypothesis until I had what Liz mentioned, a very terrible turn on the dance floor at a very iconic tango club called La Confiteria Ideal. So that's where this bit starts. I hurried away from La Ideal, searching for a taxi. A fall rainstorm was wreaking havoc on the streets of Buenos Aires, and an out-of-season sudestada, the strong, icy wind that carried the cold northward from Antarctica, was adding to the usual traffic chaos on Avenida Nueve de Julio. A blast of wind rushed over the sidewalk, dismembering the spokes in my two-peso umbrella, turning it inside out. Really? I wanted to shake my fist at the sky. You're doing this now? My stomach let out a growl that was almost a roar, reminding me of the empanadas I had left behind at the tango club. For the first time in weeks, I was starving. I stuffed the umbrella in a trash can, waving at taxi after taxi. They drove on, ignoring me, their Libre lights off as the water rose to their hubcaps. I had never had trouble finding a taxi in Buenos Aires. On any given day, at any given moment, on practically any street, I barely had to raise my arm and a cab would stop for me. Not today. Today the Sudestada had caught the city by surprise and there wasn't a free taxi in sight. Meanwhile, the pangs of my gut were getting sharper, and my blood sugar was sinking into the danger zone of dizziness and trembling hands and irrational thoughts. I scanned the snack bars on the Avenida. No Milanesa, no Sandwich de Miga, no Media Luna looked the least bit appetizing, and I did not want to eat for the sake of refueling. I hurried past the Hotel Panamericano and its famous and famously expensive restaurant, Tomo Uno, ignoring the menu posted outside the brass door. I was in no mood to be tempted by Patagonian lamb I couldn't afford. Why, oh why, had I let myself get so swept up in tango? Now the bruise was smarting on my backside, and I was getting soaked to the skin. A taxi stopped at a signal a few blocks away. Its Libre light was on, its red glow radiating in the gray afternoon. See me, I thought, raising my hand, wiping the raindrops off my forehead. See me. He was too far away to see me. I stood on my tiptoes, waving my arm. The taxista's headlights flickered. The signal turned green. 
I felt a manic flash of joy when I realized he was fighting through four lanes of traffic to pick me up. And somewhere in that manic flash of joy, watching the taxista maneuver his way toward me in his bumblebee-colored fiat, I had an idea. An idea that had been percolating in the back of my mind for a while. An idea I hadn't been brave enough to enact until now. It was a crazy idea, driven by hunger and the feeling that I had nothing left to lose. I dug around in my purse for my faux wedding ring, a paper-thin gold band that had belonged to my grandma, which I wore from time to time to ward off men. My hand shook as I slipped it on. The taxi stopped. I opened the door, tossing my tango shoes in the back seat, and climbed in. Buenas tardes, I said, wishing I had thought to wring out my hair as the water trickled down my back onto the seat. The taxista turned around. His brown eyes were almond-shaped, rimmed with faint wrinkles, flecked with gold. Buenas tardes. He smiled, open-mouthed, as if he were on the verge of laughter. Where do you want to go? I twisted Grandma's ring with my thumb. I have sort of a weird request. I was trying to prepare him for my question. I was trying to prepare myself, too. Yes? I looked at the clock on the dashboard. It was after three o'clock already. Lunch was almost over. Senorita, said the taxista, still smiling, where would you like to go? I leaned forward between the seats, shifting my weight to the unbruised side of my butt. Could you take me to your favorite restaurant? The taxista braked in the middle of the avenida. Cars honked and swerved around us, but he didn't seem to care. He switched off the CB radio and turned to stare at me, his eyes confused. I'm hungry, I said, and I don't have a lot of money, and I was hoping you might know a good place that's not too far away. Eh? He knit his eyebrows, deepening the crease in the center of his forehead. He hadn't turned on the taxi meter yet. Maybe a place you go with your family, I said. For example, what kind of food are you looking for? He took his foot off the brake. Nothing fancy. I pressed my palms against the hollow in my stomach. You know, typical stuff. Empanadas, steak. Steak? He smiled. What about siga la vaca? Siga la vaca. I'd heard the name somewhere. Don't a lot of tourists go there? He steered to the right, coasting next to the gutter. You're right. Everyone knows that place. Let me think. He still hadn't started the meter. A good steak. A good steak. So, so he ended up taking me to this neighborhood steakhouse that would have taken me, I don't know if I ever would have found it, or it would have taken me years to find. And I had this uh, bife de lomo, or filet mignon, that to this day is still one of the best steaks I have ever had in my life. And after that, I, I felt like... I had been living in Buenos Aires for a couple of years, but I felt like this was a new level of serendipity. So I kept repeating the taxi adventures and just wanting to see what it might, where it might lead. And it eventually led to New York. And um, it eventually led to me meeting a couple of lady cab drivers who eventually inspired me to get my taxi license. And I drove a taxi for, for a year in New York City. And I want to read you just one more bit um, from one of the early taxi shifts when I was discovering that a lot of the metaphors and the lessons and the, the symbols of tango were also applicable in the context of driving the taxi. Oh, and by the way, the garage is called Team Taxi Systems. It was still dark when I pulled out of the team parking lot. I pressed play on the CD player, grateful that this cab had a CD player, and out came the foreboding sounds of Astor Piazzolla's Buenos Aires Zero Hour. 
The tango was a perfect match for the industrial desolation of Long Island City before dawn. I followed the other cabs down 31st Street. Their tail lights bled into the crystalline air. We were the only cars on the road. I drove as they drove, slowing down and easing the taxi over the axle-splitting potholes at the entrance to the Queensboro Bridge, trying to adjust my body to the Crown Victoria, which was a lot like feeling out a new partner at the beginning of a tango. How sensitive were the brakes? How responsive the accelerator? Which way did the steering wheel tilt? How far did I sink into the springs in the driver's seat? In the tango clubs, early on, even at the toothless milongas, terrified of making a mistake on the floor, I would refuse to look up, to meet anyone's eyes and risk an invitation to dance. Y vos? And you? Said the men who would approach my table, glancing at my tango shoes. Bailas o no? Do you dance or not? In the taxi, on those first two shifts, I'd done the same thing passing so many potential passengers, refusing to stop for anyone who looked the least bit frantic. As long as I was a neophyte, the most frightening passenger was the passenger in a hurry. <laughs> Today will be different, I vowed, inhaling the artificial sweetness of the Christmas tree air freshener hanging on the rearview mirror, which was no match for the odors the Saturday night passengers had left behind. The cab absorbed their cologne, their booze, their cigarette smoke, mixing them with the sweat of the driver before me and the acrid smell of my own fear. Hello, terror. Hello, disorientation, I thought, pulling off the Queensboro Bridge and turning left onto Second Avenue. Let's go for a ride. So, and I was never a good taxi driver. <laughs> I, and I never lost the fear, but I developed a different relationship to it as I as I went along, as I progressed, as I drove longer. But um, it was always a part of the job for me. So I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about the book, or about Buenos Aires, or about Berlin, or about food. Um, Hi. Thanks. Hi. Um, well, I, I just wanted to mention that um, I have a little bit of experience with Cafe Ideal in, in uh, Buenos Aires, mm -hmm. um, and with a little bit with places to eat in uh, in Buenos Aires and elsewhere. And with Lomo, I'd like to know first where where your where the the discovery uh, of the Lomo place or the name of it or anything. Of but course. Mostly, yeah. Mostly, um, I wondered about just the basic idea here of get, getting taxi drivers to uh, identify, you know, great eating places. When, when you were a taxi driver, um, did you discover eating places that, whether any of your passengers ever asked you or not, that you would have, you know, passed on to them, or, th or in other words, did your experience as a taxi driver encourage this whole idea of combining the search for a good place to eat with the experience of a taxi driver? And when you, or in other words, when you were driving the taxi, did you have any chance to try restaurants? You know, how did you, how do you make the link between the two, uh, mm -hmm. the two things? So. Mm. Well, so to Lomo and uh, yeah, and answer to your first question, I should have said the name of the restaurant is Parilla Peña or uh, Parisha Peña. Um, and if you go to Argentina, if you go to Buenos Aires, I uh, definitely recommend that you stop by, and also have the provoleta, uh -huh. the grilled provolone. Uh -huh. It's some of the best in the city. My wife and I found a uh, really great Lomo place when we were there when our family was there. I don't remember the name, maybe she does, I don't know. But anyway, on to, uh, on to the, uh, the basic mm -hmm. idea here. Yeah, and actually, 
when I started to drive the taxi, I realized that it was a little bit preposterous to ask taxi drivers about where they ate on duty because I realized within the first few hours of my first shift that you really do eat where you can park and go to the bathroom, right, right, which is that. totally unromantic. And right. I thought before I started driving, well, that's not very much fun. But then when I began driving, I realized, well, of course, this is what you do. But also, but that means that you can also learn about places where you would go off duty. And I would get right. a lot of good tips from passengers passengers and I would stop by it toward the right. end of my shift or after my shift and test out their recommendations but I right. did find one place um, driving in New York there's right. a really great spice shop that's a very famous called Calustians but a lot of people don't know above Calustians is a deli where they make right. a sandwich called Mujadara which is this biblical mixture of lentils and rice and caramelized right. onions and tahini and it costs five dollars and it's perfection and it's right next to a taxi stand so great answer right thank you you're welcome hi hi i also have two questions uh the first one is if anybody asked you anything strange when you were a taxi driver or mm -hmm. surprising oh well on my first shift i picked up this um intoxicated englishman who wanted to go to breakfast which i thought was a little bit odd and i told him i had to work <laughs> <laughs> and my second question um i lived in berlin for quite a time uh -huh. and um i mean german people don't go out to eat german food a lot they eat at home so did you find i don't know what kind of just wondering what kind of restaurants you found maybe in berlin yeah, the German, the food scene in Berlin is not, is, is, mm, how do you say, compared to D.C. or New York, it's in its infancy, I guess you could say. And, but a lot of the things, a lot of the things that I really enjoyed eating were recommendations from the Turkish taxi drivers mm -hmm. in Berlin. They were recommending restaurants where they were cooking the food of the regions where they came from. Nothing to do with doner kebab. And where was it? Like and uh, <laughs> in a lot of, um, in little Istanbul, around Cottbus or Tor and Kreuzberg. Okay. Mm -hmm. So places like Konyali, where they make this, it's like Turkish pizza, but it's different. It's, it's a flat a flatbread with ground beef and sumac and fresh parsley. And then there was another kufta place, 24-hour kufta pl parlor where they butcher their own veal and make this beautiful kufta sausage called gelgor in the inigo style. And then another place called Adana Grill where they do grilled lamb chops and they grill them before your eyes. So, um, But I did meet one taxi driver who insisted on taking me to an East German cafeteria mm -hmm. where they serve a dish called dead grandma, yeah. which is a, a mixture of uh, bloodwurst and uh, liverwurst pureed which it was actually better than it sounds. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not bad. <laughs> Thank you. No, cool. Hello, I live in New York City and sort of have the reverse experience because uh, we have car services up in Washington Heights and my guy wants me to feed him. So I usually bring him a brownie, and if I'm coming back from the airport, he likes those Aunt Annie's hot dog pretzels. <laughs> Did anyone feed you? I have not been lucky enough to find someone like you to feed me. <laughs> not yet. Not yet, okay. But I do want to start driving a cab in Berlin, and who knows? Maybe that will happen someday. <laughs> okay. I have a question, which is, um, now that you've kind of completed this stage of your journey, how, what's next as far as your kind of food exploration and writing? Like, do you have another idea of what, another thing that you want to do or a continuation of this or something new? Well, I would really, like I said, I'm, I do would like to get my cab license in Berlin. I think that would just kind of complete the circle. And also it's a way to become more intimate with the city and to explore the food scene that way just through driving into neighborhoods I might not visit day to day and then getting recommendations from passengers but I dream of going to Tokyo and spending a few months there and doing a series of taxi adventures there um, I mean among other things that drivers wore white gloves which is just kind of a charming <laughs> side detail but um, I understand there they don't have street numbers and everything is sort of 
directions are sort of it's behind the place with the octopus balls and next to the next to the store that sells the comic books like I don't know how you could possibly navigate a city of that size without street numbers. And then the food culture in Japan, everything I read about it is just, it sounds totally, it sounds extraordinary. And I'd love to explore it through the lens of the taxi drivers there. Hi. Hi. Um, so I actually, I moved to DC from New York City uh, last fall and my most, my last apartment in New York was just down the street from Colestians. Um, so I would spend a lot of time in those cafes and restaurants on that street. Um, and I found that during lunchtime they'd fill up with taxi drivers because of all the free parking and it seemed like taxi drivers would meet and eat there together. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if you like became part of that taxi driver culture in New York and would you sit and eat with other drivers? Not so much, no. I never, I was kind of, I was a terrible taxi driver and I was, I mean, those were the drivers who knew what they were doing and had the luxury of taking a break. I would spend most of the 10 to 12 hours trying to make my lease fee because the way it works in New York is if you lease your cab from a garage, you have to pay something like $130 to lease the cab, plus you have to pay for gas and credit card fees and everything else. And then once you make that money, you're free to earn money for yourself. And it usually took me eight to 10 hours to actually break even. And by that time I was racing to try to make some money for myself. So I never got good enough at the job there to be able to sit down with the other cabbies, but I did stop at that taxi stand often and wistfully kind of wish I could afford to pause as they paused but they knew the streets and they they were more clever than I was about getting fares and being aggressive my um I married a cab driver and he calls me a a vegetarian among cannibals when it comes to <laughs> <laughs> driving the cab so um yeah my other question was I wanted to hear about how you met your husband but you can Answer his question first. Oh. Okay. So I had been doing the, a series of taxi adventures in Berlin, and it was word was getting around about what I was doing. And I one day I got this very odd but charming but strange but kind of interesting sounding email from a cab driver who described himself as a little gourmet. And he said he could take me on a food tour of and show me some places that he knew about. And I hadn't had any German food yet and I was in Berlin and this was just a shame. I had to have some German food. And I thought, okay, sure, why not? That's That sounds like fun. And we met and I kind of had a, a lightning bolt reaction I wasn't expecting him to be a fascinating person that I would want to keep talking to and he ended up not only being a little gourmet but also just having a really intimate relationship with Berlin he'd been there for 20 years he would danced on the wall the day after it had come down he'd been in Berlin during the golden 90s when the city was just it was wild and the feeling was anything was possible and the way he described that was just Complete, it intrigued me completely. And so we ended up spending more time together and I left Berlin and came back to New York and he came to visit me in New York and drove on a taxi shift with me in the passenger seat. And then I ended up moving back to Berlin to be with him. Um, and then we got married last year. Well, uh, your, your comments on New York taxis leads me to this very obvious question. Would you ever ask an Uber driver what his favorite restaurant is? <laughs> well, I don't have a smartphone. So I, I wouldn't rule it out, but it's not. Um, I feel like the, the Uber drivers don't have quite the same relationship with the city. As a, as a taxi driver does. I mean, there are exceptions, of course, and there are people who are born and bred from DC, New York, whatever, pick it. But it's not something I would do, but it's not something if somebody uses Uber and chooses to use Uber, why not get to talking about food? It's a way to build a relationship with someone. It's a very intimate thing to ask someone about their food. So on the 
on the food theme, um, in full disclosure, I've known Lane for a long time, and she's, I've had the luxury, she's a wonderful person, and um, when I met Lane, she was a vegetarian, and she <laughs> noticed the only thing that she's really talked about in the past 30 minutes is meat, so I wanted to have her sort of explore her journey um, from being a vegetarian to, um, you know, coming back to meat, and then to not talking about meat and, and saying how wonderful it is, and if you could talk about that sort of aspect of the food, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was a vegetarian for six years, and I, living in San Francisco, where it was very easy to be a vegetarian, and one day I had a really serious protein craving, and no amount of tofu or rice and beans or tempeh or seitan or whatever, it was just not going to do it, and I had a friend, I was living with a friend who had this can of Denison's chicken chili in her cupboard, and it looked so good to me. And I ate the whole can and the next day went hiking in Yosemite and felt like I had incredible power. And I thought, okay, okay, so something is happening here and now I need, I need this kind, I, my body needs this now. So I, I thought, okay, okay, chicken and fish, I'll just, I'll eat chicken and fish and it'll be all right. And then I went to Italy and then there was prosciutto and then it just all fell apart and but it was really good to have those six years not eating meat because i discovered so many foods uh, and learned how to cook vegetarian that was really when i was learning how to cook and i it was coming away from it for six years maybe come back to it with enthusiasm that i had never had about meat before so i appreciate it i think more than i would have if i hadn't been a vegetarian I would like to know if you're still dancing the tango. No, I de I destroyed my feet. Oh, and I can't cliche. dance. It's such a I, those dance. shoes are <laughs> like four inch, three and a half inch heels, and my feet so are. So you didn't destroyed. have a good experience when you. I I mean I wish I could still, but it's not physically not possible for me anymore. Okay. Then you were really quite a tango dancer, I guess, to ruin your feet over yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> But I might help one of my teachers. He's he's a really gifted teacher, and he wants to write a book about his teaching methods. And I I he wants me to help him with that. So I'm still, the metaphors are still very much alive for me. It's the most psychological of all the Latin dances. Oh my gosh, yes. And do you dance? My father taught me to dance the tango, and I met this man 47 years ago, and um, he was an American. We were in a place, and they were playing tango music, and I went, oh this. God will never know how to dance the tango. It was a first date, and he went, would you like to dance? And I got married to him three months later. Oh! <laughs> That's beautiful. And do you still dance together? Well, unfortunately, I lost my husband recently. But I'm sorry. Uh, we were dancing the tango. We danced in Paris, and we danced everywhere we could possibly find a place to tango. Yes. That's, thank you. That's really beautiful. Um, I have one more question, which is you did mention um, when you first arrived that you had lived in D.C. And I think everyone here wants to know if you ever had any food adventures in D.C. or have any recommendations well, um, in our in our neighborhoods. I never tried any taxi adventures in D.C. This was right. way before I began this right. this project. But I lived near the Clarendon stop on the Orange Line. And there was a strip mall back then, this was 1997, I don't know if this strip mall still exists, but there were two Vietnamese restaurants in this strip mall. Queen Bee and... Queen Bee and Cafe Deluxe. They're gone? Yeah. Oh, that makes me really sad because I believe it was at Queen Bee they made this rice flour pancake with a peanut sauce that haunts me. I have not found anything that is its equal to this day. So, I, that, oh, I, I'm really sad that it's doesn't exist anymore but that was really for me the peak of my the things that I ate in DC that was spectacular you'll, you'll have to come back to DC and try another cab adventure I would really know. like to do that yeah we were talking about the African food earlier absolutely and I yeah. think that would be really fascinating Definitely. to explore come back to Silver Spring yeah um, if does anyone else have any questions good I think we're all set Lane thank you so much this thank was you. so informative and thank awesome. you thank you